Welcome. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to Insight Ophthalmology. Today's lecture is on vitreous hemorrhage. So what is vitreous hemorrhage? The presence of blood in the vitreous chamber of the eye is called the vitreous hemorrhage. The vitreous chamber is actually occupied by the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is a transparent, colorless, jelly-like, hydrophobic, hydrophilic gel which helps in maintaining the transparency and structure of the eyeball. In the adult eye, the vitreous humor is about 4 ml in volume and it makes up about 80% of the globe volume. It is consists of about 99% of the vitreous humor is water and the remaining is collagen and hyaluronic acid. Any blood which is present in this vitreous cavity is called the vitreous hemorrhage. By definition, we can define this vitreous chamber as a space which is present behind the lens. So this is the lens and this is the ciliary body and these are the zonules. So the space which is bounded anteriorly by the ciliary body, the lens capsule and posteriorly it is bounded with the by the internal limiting membrane which is the innermost layer of the retina and on the lateral side it is bordered by the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body. Okay, so the space which is bounded by this, these structures is called the vitreous chamber and blood in this vitreous chamber is known as the vitreous hemorrhage. The vitreous hemorrhage is not uh, very uncommon. About 7 cases are present per every 1 lakh, uh, 1 lakh population. Anatomically, the vitreous hemorrhage can be located in two main positions. So, it can be defined as preretinal vitreous hemorrhage or it can be defined as the intravitreal uh, vitreous hemorrhage. So, the preretinal vitreous hemorrhage is of two types again the subhyloid vitreous hemorrhage and the sub ILM hemorrhage. And the intravitreal hemorrhage is mostly the dispersed variety of hemorrhage or the intragel hemorrhage. The preretinal hemorrhage in that the first one is the subhyloid hemorrhage. Subhyloid is nothing but the ex the peripheral most part of the vitreous uh, humor which is actually consisting of condensed collagen which separates the vitreous humor from the retina is called the hyloid surface of the uh, vitreous or also called the hyloid. Any blood which is present just below the hyloid is called the subhyloid hemorrhage. One important feature of subhyloid hemorrhage is that it can shift along with the change in the position. The rate of clotting is very slow and the shape can be no specific shape or it can look like a boat shape hemorrhage just like the ILM hemorrhage. Coming to the sub ILM hemorrhage, the hemorrhage which lies between the nerve fiber layer of the retina and the internal limiting membrane is known as the sub ILM hemorrhage. The sub ILM hemorrhage uh, can be differentiated from the sub hyaloid hemorrhage based on the shifting test that is it will not shift with the position of the patient. However, the sub hyaloid hemorrhage will actually shift with the uh, change in the position of the patient. The rate of clotting is very very slow. Now, the shape of the hemorrhage again like that of the subhyaloid hemorrhage can be boat shaped with a horizontal upper level. Now coming to the causes of the subhyaloid hemorrhage. Subhyaloid hemorrhage, uh, the sub ILM hemorrhage is actually seen in case of three important syndromes. The first one is the Tursen syndrome. The second one is in the retinal artery macroaneurysm and the third one is the Valsalva retino. So these are the three uh, conditions which are basically associated with the sub ILM hemorrhage and that's why I'm mentioning it over here. Now coming to the intravitreal hemorrhage proper or the intragel hemorrhage. Now the intragel hemorrhage is nothing but it's a hemorrhage which is dispersed within the vitreous gel. Now such a hemorrhage will actually settle down because of the gravity and it has uh, it will clot also very rapidly. So if you see the patient with an intragel hemorrhage and you follow up the patient you will notice that the organization of the vitreous hemorrhage will occur very rapidly in case of intragel or intravitreal hemorrhage compared to that in case of subhyloid or the sub ILN hemorrhage. 
the color of the blood also will vary in intravitreal hemorrhage based upon the extent of degeneration of the rbcs which has occurred so a fresh intravitreal hemorrhage will look red in color and then it will change in color uh, from red to yellow coming to the shape the intragel hemorrhage does not have any specific shape like that of the sub ilm or the sub hyaloid hemorrhage and the reason is that because the in within the vitreous uh, humor or within the vitreous chamber there is uh, there can be pockets of liquefaction and there can be clumping of gel structures so we do, uh, because the gel is dispersed in various proportions within uh, within the vitreous chamber the shape it can also vary in case of intragel hemorrhage so this picture over here shows you the ilm bleed and we can see that this is a typical boat side uh, boat uh, like hemorrhage with the horizontal upper level similarly here we can see a boat shape hemorrhage with an horizontal upper level this over here is an intragel hemorrhage and you can see the shape is quite varied it is not a typical boat level over here we can see a person with tersen syndrome and this is a big intra uh, big preretinal hemorrhage or the sub ilm hemorrhage the symptoms of vitreous hemorrhage will vary from sudden painless complete vision loss to a very mild hazy uh, vision patients often will describe new floaters which can be sudden in onset and they describe them as faint cobweb like shadows or less commonly they will also uh, describe a reddish tint to their vision some of the patient may also describe seeing flashes of light in their peripheral field which is called photopsias from the traction which is applied to the retina the density and the location of the hemorrhage will actually govern the severity of the symptoms uh that the patient is going to experience if there's a very small vitreous hemorrhage very mild vitreous hemorrhage often the patient will have just the floaters however a moderate case will often result in dark streaks in the field of vision whereas if there's a dense vitreous hemorrhage there will be a significant decrease in the visual equity so as you can see that whenever the eye is normal the vitreous cavity is clear and the field of vision is also normal and the patient is seeing clearly however in case of this as you can see these small small yellow structures are nothing they represent the mild vitreous hemorrhage and because of these uh, small opacities the passage of the light through the eyeball will be hindered by the presence of these vitreous floaters which will generate the shadows on the retinal surface and because of that shadows we will also see shadows in our field of vision and such shadows are freely floating and they will also move with the movement of the eyeball and because they are freely floating they are called floaters and since they are present in the vitreous cavity they are called vitreous floaters so what are the causes of vitreous hemorrhage the normal vitreous cavity is free of the blood vessels and the retinal blood vessels which are normal uh, which have normal architecture they usually do not bleed into the vitreous cavity however there are some reasons that can cause vitreous hemorrhage the first reason is bleeding from an abnormally changed retinal vessel in this case what we have shown over here is a neovascularization neovascularization is nothing but there are new vessels which are actually abnormal and they occur in the setting of retinal ischemia the second cause could be breakthrough of the retinal or a subretinal bleeding what it means is that there might be actually bleeding occurring subretinally and that subretinal bleed after some time will break uh, from the retina into the vitreous cavity and then result in the vitreous hemorrhage this type of pathology is usually seen in case of the ARMD and uh, specifically in case of the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy in which sub retinal uh, uh, massive sub retinal bleeds can occur because of the choroidal neovascular membrane and that bleed can again find a way into the vitreous and can lead to the vitreous hemorrhage also the third cause could be the influx of blood from the adjacent structure we know that the vitreous cavity anteriorly is lined by the ciliary body and which is again anterior to that what we have is the anterior chamber and the anterior segment so any cause any pathology which causes bleeding in the anterior segment and that which is called the hyphema can actually cause a seepage of the blood from this connection into the vitreous chamber and can lead to vitreous hemorrhage 
The fourth cause that could be is from the bleeding from the normal retinal vessels. So what did I tell you that the normal retinal vessels will not usually uh, bleed. However, in certain conditions like the retinal tear when there's a break or a tear in the retina because of the pull of the vitreous, the blood vessel which is attached actually what happens is that the vitreous has strong uh, attachments to the blood vessels and with aging or uh, in with degeneration of the vitreous which occurs in case of myopic patients as the vitreous starts separating from uh, as the hyaluride starts separating from the retina they will also pull the they will cause a pull on the retinal blood vessel and along with the retinal tear at that time they can be bleeding from that normal retinal vessels also and they can cause a vitreous hemorrhage now let us talk about the vascular causes of the vitreous hemorrhage now as you can see there are a, there are so many causes which can actually lead to vitreous hemorrhage but in this the most important one and the most common one is the proliferated diabetic retinopathy and you can see that about 32 percent of uh, the total vascular causes uh, which can lead to vitreous hemorrhage are actually caused by the proliferative diabetic retinopathy the others are the central and branch retinal artery occlusion the proliferative sickle cell retinopathy age-related macular degeneration specifically the neovascular amd or the wet amd Coats disease, ROP, ocular ischemic syndrome, macroaneurysm, hypertensive retinopathy, venous stasis retinopathy. Now, if you notice in all these uh, retinopathies, in all these vascular causes, the underlying pathophysiology is neovascularization. And it is this neovascularization of the new vessels which are very fragile, which can bleed anytime and cause the vitreous hemorrhage. So what happens is in all uh, these conditions, especially like in the uh, especially in the PDR or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there is a setting of chronic ischemia in the retina because of which the vascular endothelial growth factor, which is an important factor uh, for the vasculogenesis, which is called VEGF, uh, is stimulated and the cells will actually the RPE, that is the retinal pigment epithelium, will secrete more amount of VEGF, and this VEGF will cause neovascularization and these neovascularization uh, vessels that means the new vessels are quite fragile and they can bleed anytime and because of which we will have vitreous hemorrhage so this picture over here shows the proliferative diabetic retinopathy patient over here are the new vessels you can see the new vessels how they look they do not follow any pattern they are very fragile and they can bleed anytime and over here also you can see on the disc there are new vessels which are present and here we can see a preretinal hemorrhage. Now vitreous hemorrhage can also occur along with a retinal tear. So over here in this picture we can see a retinal tear and you can see here is the normal blood vessel and this blood vessel has actually come out along with the tear. So because of that traction and pull of the hyaloid vessel also can get injured and can lead to vitreous hemorrhage. Next, the vitreous hemorrhage can also occur in retinal vein occlusion. Retinal vein occlusion, especially over here, as I've shown, is the central retinal vein occlusion in which you can see this tomato splash appearance because of the flame-shaped hemorrhages. So these hemorrhages are usually the uh, intraretinal hemorrhages and they are not the vitreal hemorrhages. But in the setting of ischemia and increased capillary non-perfusion areas, that is the areas where we do not have uh, proper supply in the retina, when the retinal ischemia sets in again neovascularization start and once neovascularization starts this neovascularization will grow on the retina and it can bleed into the vitreous cavity leading into the vitreous hemorrhage then in case of another disease which is associated with inflammation is a disease called the eels disease Eels disease is actually idiopathic occlusive peripheral periphlebitis. So what I mean to say is it is a type of vasculitis which is the inflammation of the blood vessels and here specifically it is the inflammation of the male uh, of the veins and it typically affects uh, both the eyes and affects uh, the males basically and usually the males of about five, 15 to 45 years are actually affected. Here the cause of eel disease is usually not known it is believed to be an immunological reaction to an exogenous uh, tubercular protein or it is uh, TB 
or a tubercular protein hypersensitivity. So such patients usually present with recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. So such a patient, if there's a male patient who's coming up with recurrent vitreous hemorrhage with periphlebitis on the fundus examination with sheathing of the blood vessels and exudates around the blood vessels as uh, seen over here, the Eels disease should be suspected. Now, vitreous hemorrhage can also be seen in case of sickle cell retinopathy. Sickle cell retinopathy is an ocular manifestation of the sickle cell disease in which there's abnormal hemoglobin present which can lead to sickling of the RBCs causing ischemia of the uh, surrounding areas which are supplied by those specific blood vessels. So as you can see over here, one typical feature which is very important on the fundus examination of a sickle cell retinopathy is the fan-shaped neovascularization. So over here we can see, uh, have a look at these neovascularization. They look like fans. Okay, so this is called the fan C fan shape neovascularization, which is very common in sickle cell retinopathy. And along with that, the type of hemorrhage is also very specific to sickle cell retinopathy, and it is described described as a salmon patch uh, hemorrhage okay in the sickle cell retinopathy because of the salmon color to the hemorrhage coming to ocular trauma causing vitreous hemorrhage it is the most common cause of vitreous hemorrhage especially in patients who are less than 40 years of age and uh, Usually, uh, blunt trauma of any sort, direct ocular trauma can lead to uh, occult globe, uh, globe rupture and usually at the site of which vitreous incarceration can also be noted and usually in such cases, the vitreous hemorrhage will be usually associated with the rupture of the choroid, which is called choroidal rupture and retinal dialysis, giant retinal tears, Berlin's edema, sometimes even optic nerve will get avulsed and there might be optic nerve avulsion, vitreous base can get uh, avulsed also. Then again, the uh, vitreous hemorrhage can be associated with an intraocular foreign body or a so basically a penetrating or a perforating trauma with the retained intraocular foreign body. Again, vitreous incarceration can be present at the site where there is a perforation or penetration, and through that entry site only we can actually have uh, entry of the blood into the vitreous cavity or the retina might, the vessels might get damaged, and that can again lead to the vitreous hemorrhage. Again, one more uh, one more thing which can happen with trauma is the Tursen syndrome. Tursen syndrome is nothing but it is a subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage which is associated along with the intraocular hemorrhage or the intravitreal hemorrhage. So, uh, this is a picture of a diffuse hemorrhage which is seen after a blunt trauma in a patient and you can see uh, the optic disc is just hazily seen and there's a total reddish tint to the fundus. Over here is a picture which shows uh, a shaken baby syndrome picture okay so sometimes they can be trauma to uh, 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 the infants and that can lead to a, a picture like this in which we can notice retinal hemorrhages premacular retinal folds vitreous hemorrhages cotton wool spots so an infant who comes with vitreous hemorrhage we should actually um, try to rule out a case of shaken baby syndrome or assault to the baby so this picture over here shows a case of Tursen syndrome and Tursen syndrome is nothing but vitreous hemorrhage which is associated with the subarachnoid bleeding or the intracerebral bleed. The pathogenesis of the uh, intraocular or the intravitreal hemorrhage in case of Tursen syndrome is controversial. Some suggest that it is the subarachnoid blood that will come into the vitreous cavity via the optic nerve sheath. So as I told you that the optic nerve sheath is continuous with the meninges of the optic nerve is continuous with the meninges of the brain and therefore the subarachnoid space is also continuous and it is believed that the subarachnoid hemorrhage might actually seep through that subarachnoid space around the optic nerve and and then come into the vitreous cavity however that's just a controversial pathophysiology then there are a lot of anterior segment causes which can also lead to vitreous hemorrhage these are cataract extraction secondary iol and a drop of the iol and then when the surgeon tries to remove the iol there might be excessive manipulation which can cause damage to the blood vessels leading to the intravitreal bleed then in case of uveitis uh, then in the case of uveitis glaucoma and hyphema syndrome in which there can be a hyphema and that can trickle into the vitreous leading to the vitreous hemorrhage Coming to blood disorders, a patient can have systemic disorders. He could be actually on anticoagulation, which is very common in patients who are on dialysis or those who have undergone a stent 
and with the history of cardiovascular diseases then similarly if the patient has problem with the coagulation like either the platelet count is very low which is called thrombocytopenia or patients with hemophilia who are more prone to bleeding very easily so uh, in those patients if you do a general examination you might be able to pick up such patient as shown in this picture the patient has a hemarthrosis and there will be recurrent there will be history of recurrent swelling in the knee and after very trivial traumas because of the excessive bleeding into the knee joint which can occur with just uh, minimal trauma because they they can bleed more and the ability to clot is less so what is the natural history of vitreous hemorrhage the blood in the vitreous gel will initially form a localized clot after the clot has been formed this clot will undergo fibrinolysis that means there will be blood, the breakdown of that clot after fibrinolysis the dispersion of the hemorrhage through the gel will actually occur after the hemorrhage has become dispersed now what will start is hemolysis that is the erythrocytes will start breaking and they will lose their hemoglobin once the erythrocytes lose their hemoglobin the erythrocytes usually are biconcave in their structure now they will become spheroidal in shape after they lose their hemoglobin and the hemoglobin comes out there will be a process which is called biodegradation of the released hemoglobin and the hemoglobin which is red in color will now be converted subsequently into bilirubin and that is the uh, the bilirubin which is yellow in color will now stain the vitreous hemorrhage into an ochre yellow or an orange color the iron in the blood which is present and once it comes out after the bio integration bio disintegration of the hemoglobin will promote vitreous liquefaction so this is a very important point now the uh, there are certain differences with the way the blood clots in the vitreous cavity and with the uh, in the way it clots in our normal body okay so the clot formation is quite rapid in case of vitreous uh, chamber and uh, it will occur with sharp borders as the collagen in the vitreous will actually promote the platelet aggregation number 2 is so the clot formation is very rapid however the lysis of the clot is slow because of the lack of the early polymorphonuclear leukocyte response so what happens is that the vitreous chamber already has collagen inside it and therefore this collagen will promote the platelets to come and stick to it and therefore once there's a vitreous hemorrhage a clot formation will occur very soon however the vitreous chamber does not have blood supply and therefore all the pmns that is the neutrophils macrophages they have to come from the blood now since the vitreous chamber does not have that blood supply the polymorphic leukocyte response will be slow and therefore the lysis of that clot will be slow other thing is that the rbcs which are getting lysed they are getting lysed extracellularly so what i mean to say is in the normal blood the macrophages will ingest those rbcs and uh, break them inside uh, inside uh, by ingestion after the macrophages and within the macrophages there will be digestion of the rbcs however in the vitreous hemorrhage the lysis of the rbc is extracellular the rbcs however can sometimes remain intact for months to months in the vitreous gel now sometimes there can be a condition which can occur in vitreous hemorrhage which is called cholesterolosis bulbi so what happens is that after the breakdown of the rbcs sometimes there can be cholesterol particles which can be formed okay and when these cholesterol particles are going to be present in the vitreous cavity they actually settle down at the bottom of the vitreous cavity and with the movement of the eyeball they are going to get dispersed into the vitreous cavity and then again they are going to settle down so such a phenomena is called cholesterolosis bulbi because there are cholesterol particles present in the vitreous cavity and this is called synchysis scintillans now synchysis scintillans can actually be differentiated from asteroid hyalosis because asteroid hyalosis are nothing but they are calcium crystals and they will remain suspended within the vitreous cavity and they do not deposit or do not gravitate however the synchysis scintillans will actually deposit and then they will get dispersed with the movement of the eyeball and again they will deposit down the synchysis scintillans or the cholesterolosis bulbi is often associated with very poor vision in a patient with vitreous hemorrhage now accumulation of the rbc and its debris when it is suspended in the vitreous collagen moreover the cells uh, the hemoglobin is converted into bilirubin which is yellow in color will now lead to formation of a membrane sometime which is called the ochre membrane and it is called ochre membrane because of the yellow color to it 
Coming to vitreous hemorrhage leading to glaucoma. Yes, vitreous hemorrhage can lead to glaucoma because all these RBCs can actually go and damage the, they can actually enter the uh, anterior chamber because from there they are going to go to the uh, angle of the anterior chamber and in the angle of the anterior chamber they can cause direct toxicity to the trabecular meshwork because of the iron or sometimes the macrophages which are laden with the RBCs they can go and clog the trabecular meshwork which will lead to decrease in the outflow of the aqueous humor leading to increase in the intraocular pressure and finally causing the glaucoma. So this is the reason why in vitreous hemorrhage usually we prescribe the patient iotem or timolol eye drops uh, which is a beta blocker an anti-glaucoma medication because we are actually suspecting that these we are actually predicting that these patients might develop glaucoma so how do we diagnose and what are the tests that we should do in a case of vitreous hemorrhage the first thing that we should do is a proper visual equity documentation second we have to do a slit lamp biomicroscopy to rule out the anterior causes of the vitreous hemorrhage so in the anterior chamber we can or in the anterior segment we have to look for any neovascularization because neovascularization of the angle neovascularization of the iris can sometimes tell you that there's a pathology in the posterior segment in which there is neovascularization like the proliferative diabetic retinopathy or the central retinal vein occlusion. Then we have to do a good dilated fundus examination and look for look for the possible cause of the vitreous hemorrhage and this can be done usually if the if there's a localized vitreous hemorrhage in cases when we have a, a, a diffuse vitreous hemorrhage we will only see a red tint and red fundal glow and the examination of the fundus might not be possible so in such case we will have to rely on the b scan now the fundus examination should always be done with the scleral indentation or scleral depression because I told you that one of the causes of vitreous hemorrhage is the uh, retinal tears or the horseshoe shaped tears and they are usually present in the periphery. So peripheral retinal examination is very important and that can be done using the scleral depression. Sometimes CD scan and B scan is also important especially in case of trauma in which we might want to know the presence of an intraocular foreign body. FFA also can have a role to find out neovascularization but can only be done if the vitreous hemorrhage is uh, localized and not diffuse because presence of hemorrhage is going to uh, cause uh, block fluorescence and it might actually block the fluorescence and it is difficult to visualize the fundus on FFA that is fundus fluorescent angiography. Gonioscopy is a technique in which we will actually visualize the angles and it is done to look for the neovascularization in the angles of the anterior chamber. B scan is very important in case of vitreous hemorrhage. The fresh vitreous hemorrhage or a vitreous hemorrhage in a vitrectomized eye will look like multiple dot uh, like echoes which will be very low reflective and they are better visualized on a high gain uh, setting of the B scan. In case of long standing vitreous hemorrhage the dot like echoes will change uh, to a highly reflective membrane because the vitreous hemorrhage will now get, uh, get uh, organized into membranes. So coming to subhyoid hemorrhage, subhyoid hemorrhage will also look like dot like echoes. However, they will not clot so easily as the vitreous hemorrhage. So the B scan will also help you in identifying the other pathology which can lead to a vitreous hemorrhage. So we can identify a retinal detachment, we can identify a, a posterior vitreous detachment on a B scan and uh, we can also sometimes look at uh, certain tumors which might be a cause of the um, vitreous hemorrhage. Sometimes intraocular foreign body might be present and the foreign body tract can be localized through which the, through which the hemorrhage might be seeping into the vitreous cavity. Coming to the management, the vitreous hemorrhage can be actually tackled in three ways, conservatively, medically and surgically. The conservative treatment of vitreous hemorrhage is actually head elevation and along with head elevation we usually prescribe vitamin C because vitamin C helps in clotting and along with the vitamin C we will actually prescribe them some anti-glaucoma medications like iotem to, in, to bring down the pressure of the eyeball and along with that what we do is we observe the patient okay so what do we do is we observe the patient before we actually intervene and do the surgery this observation is usually done for about six months the purpose of doing a head elevation or an erect posture is that when the patient is actually erect the vitreous hemorrhage will actually settle down in the inferior part of the vitreous chamber and thereby 
the patient will still have some of the uh, field of vision remaining in the superior however when the patient is in the supine position this vitreous uh, uh, the vitreous hemorrhage will actually get dispersed the blood will get dispersed throughout the vitreous cavity and then it will be very difficult for the patient to see okay so head elevation is actually advised in case of vitreous hemorrhage the other medical treatment is giving intravitreal anti vegf agents like lucentis avantis uh, avastin sorry and uh, the reason why we give it is in especially in cases of neovascularization like proliferative diabetic retinopathy and uh, central retinal vein occlusion in any case in which we are suspecting the neovascularization we can actually give the intravitreal anti vegf agents another treatment modality is doing a pan retinal photocoagulation So, what is the role of laser or PRP? That is a pan retinal photocoagulation. In pan retinal photocoagulation, we will actually photocoagulate almost uh, the 360 degrees, the peripheral part of the retina till the ora serrata from the arcades. So, as we actually ablate a lot of retina, we are bringing down the metabolic need of the Uh, retina and thereby decreasing its need for the oxygen and as the need for oxygen decreases okay the vegf will also decrease and it will lead to uh, the decrease in the neovascularization and this is how we are tackling actually the uh, cause of the vitreous hemorrhage in such patients so a landmark diabetic retinopathy study actually showed that prp is very useful in reducing the chances of severe vision loss in proliferative diabetic retinopathy similarly the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study that is the etdrs it suggested that in the older patients who have type 2 diabetic mellitus that is the metabolic type of diabetes mellitus and who have severe npdr or early pdr a prompt laser is very uh, much is was actually much better than a deferral when compared to young patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus so whenever we see a patient with early pdr and who is old or a pdr case as such it is better to do a pan retinal photocoagulation In case of central retinal vein occlusion study which is called the CVOS recommended that scattered panretinal photocoagulation should be done in cases of CRVO only after the development of neovascularization of the iris and angle so not in all the patient of CRVO we should do laser we should do laser only once the iris starts developing neovascularization or on gonioscopy we see that neovascularization is actually present in the angle Okay uh, according to the branch retinal vein occlusion study scatter uh, laser should be done only after development of neovascularization okay so again for brvo also we have to wait for the development of neovascularization just like the central retinal vein occlusion study now again laser has one important role in case of retinal breaks so whenever we have these breaks like horseshoe shaped there we have to apply this laser around the breaks to cause adhesions and to prevent the seepage of the vitreous into this hole and causing the retinal detachment so in case of retinal breaks we do a prophylactic laser which is called the barrage laser which will cause adhesions between the retina and the underlying rp So what is the role of vitrectomy in case of vitreous hemorrhage vitrectomy is nothing but it is the removal cutting and removal of the vitreous uh, chamber or vitreous humor okay so in case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy vitrectomy along with pan retinal photocoagulation it it helps in halting the neovascularization how because when uh, there is ischemia the vegf will be released by the retinal pigment epithelium cells into the vitreous cavity and the collagen fibers which are actually present in the vitreous cavity will act as a scaffold and they will actually help in the propagation of this vegf through the vitreous cavity so once we remove this vitreous uh, humor from the eye and replace it with silicon oil what happens is that the silicon oil will prevent the diffusion of the vegf into the vitreous cavity and will prevent the further neovascularization so this was what was proven by the diabetic vitreous to me study which shared, which actually showed that in type 1 diabetes mellitus when there is severe vision loss or when there is non clearing of the vitreous hemorrhage for at least 1 month vitrectomy should be done similarly in case of retinal vein occlusion in which vitreous hemorrhage is more common especially in brvo cases compared to crvo cases 
vitreous hemorrhage will not if if it's not resolving in 1 to 3 months it is better that we go with vitrectomy after a sectoral photocoagulation so this picture over here tries to explain what is actually done in a vitrectomy so in a vitrectomy if this is the eye we put a port through which contain uh, through which uh, we put over here a lead by pi light pipe which can help which will actually help us to visualize what we are doing during a surgery through another uh, port uh, constructed we will introduce a vitrector vitrector is nothing but a cutter which is going to cut this vitreous chamber a vitreous humor which is present in the vitreous cavity and through one side what we have is an infusion pump which will be continuously putting uh, saline area uh, uh, irrigating the vitreous with the saline and also will there will be a suction okay so whatever is being cut by the vitrector will be sucked through the suction and this entire vitreous will be actually removed and the entire vitreous cavity will now be replaced with the saline so when we are doing vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage we are actually re re removing the entire vitreous along with the blood which is present in the vitreous so that the patient can see clearly however vitrectomy is reserved for non resolving vitreous hemorrhage only and usually the cut off is taken to be about 6 months okay so if does not resolve by 6 months patients can undergo a vitrect a vitrectomy also called the pars plana vitrectomy So this was in detail about vitreous hemorrhage I hope it was useful for you and if it was kindly share and like thank you and have a nice day